tired. It's been a long week. I uh, woke up last night in the middle of the night and my hands were all swollen. I could only close them about this much. But uh, I took a little ibuprofen this morning and ran them under some hot water and seemed to be limbering up. But yeah, sawmelon and lumber, moving lumber has been uh, kicking my ass this week. So all but the three biggest pine logs have been milled. This one is a little too big for the mill, so I went and hand hewed the side of it a little bit yesterday. And uh, I'll probably work on that this afternoon or tomorrow morning and get this milled up. It'll be a little bit of a fight until I get it down to a manageable size, but there's going to be a lot of beautiful clear lumber in this. Alright, so we got the biggest log of the bunch, this monster white pine on here. And it's so big. <laughs> that it's wider than the mill. Uh, so that's a problem. So if I try to slide it down, the carriage is going to hit here and we're not going to be able to mill it. So I went through and I made some cuts with the chainsaw and now I'm going to go through with my axe and chop it down. And this is basically what they used to do when they hand hewed beams. Um, except their axes had a curved handle and a wider head. It was called a broad axe, but this will work. Hand hewn beams, baby. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's too wide. It's what? It's too wide. Yeah. yeah, it sticks out past the tracks. And I take like an inch down here and like two or three inches down there. So I curved it with the chainsaw. And went through. Oh. I need a broad axe. Or an adds. An adds would work well. So we had wrestled, Grandpappy and I had wrestled this big beast onto the mill the other day with the tractor. And I cut as much off the top of it as I can, but I need to roll it. So I've been trying to roll it this morning. I put a chain on it with a big steel bar and I can get it to go a little bit. And I think when Grandpappy gets here and he gets on the other side of the PV, I think we can spin it. But I've gotten it to go from here to here by doing this. And you can see ever so slowly rotating. But oh, is it tired? I kind of wish I had more help. We really need to get Alex down here. Can't be having him in Maine anymore. <laughs> so I'll readjust these chains and hope, uh, hopefully when Grandpappy gets on the other side with the big cant hook, we'll be able to spin it. And once I get this face vertical here, I think I can cut off a good chunk of this log and make it a wee bit lighter. Yeah, a lot of work. Alright, reinforcements have arrived. You ready? Yeah. Are they? Even Akiva approves. 
As Steve had been doing the brunt of the work on the milling process, we came down for the weekend to help out. We got a lot of work done, but before we see that, why don't we learn a little bit about the milling process? How we measure out a log, rolling it, cutting it, changing out blades, things like that. Sound good? All right, let's do it. This is the bark, the supper part. And then right to here, this is the sapwood. So this is the actual living part of the tree. Uh, this is where sap's going up and down and is a high moisture content. So this part you don't use for woodworking. It, uh, it's very rot prone uh, and isn't as strong as the heartwood. And then this is all the heartwood, the darker wood here. And then this dot is the pith. That's the very center of the tree. And you want to eliminate about that much around the pith. Uh, and that's also really rot prone. It's unstable wood, so you want to get rid of that. And you can see that it's already kind of falling apart in there. This wood over here, I can't pull it up. It's really, really hard. And this is good heartwood. So what I've done is marked out my cuts, and we're going to be just above and just below the pith. And out of this one board here, we'll box out the pith later and throw that away, you know, throw it in the wood stove. Um, to the right and the left of the pith, I'll have great quarter sawn lumber. It'll be a nice one inch board. And then this nice big section of clear timber here is five and a half inches thick. And we're gonna use that for part of the deadwood or part of the keel. So the keel timber needs to be 10 inches thick and we're gonna make that up out of two five inch thick beams bolted together. So I made it a little bit fat so that if this shrinks a little bit, there's still some wiggle room and we can plane some off of both sides to get it nice and square to work with uh, and still have our full five inch thickness. And then this top part here is a little thin, but there's still some heartwood here and it goes up at that end of the log a little bit. So we'll get a little more down there. So we'll get an okay board out of here. It won't be great. This will be beautiful. This will be thin, but it'll be really nice quarter sawn lumber on the right and on the left. And then we've got another five and a half inch thick chunk that's going to come out of the bottom. And we centered the pith. So we pulled the mill back and we measured down from the blade to the pith. And then we slid the mill to the other end and we measured on the other side. And since the log tapers, the other end was about an inch lower. So we put a floor jack underneath it, jacked it up the inch, put a shim underneath it. So this pith is perfectly parallel all the way through the log. I mean, we're assuming it goes straight through the log. But this end and that end are at the same height. So when I cut just above the pith, it should stay just above the pith the whole way. Um, so if we hadn't jacked up the other end of the log, and with the taper in the log, that end being the pith being an inch lower, this is only a half an inch or so above the pith. So if we started a half an inch above the pith on this end, and the log was tapered, we would end up half an inch below the pith on the other end. And at some point in our log, halfway down or so, we would hit that pith. So by centering the pith, we're more likely to miss it the whole way. And if we do hit it a little bit, we'll just do more of the planing on this side and should be able to get rid of the vast majority of it. So the dogs are set, the logs clamped in, my marks are measured out. So we're gonna fire up the mill and we'll slice off it a little bit for the top and then we'll take out a two and three quarter inch chunk beam and then we'll take out the huge beam and then we'll roll it and we'll slice the last two. So, it should be pretty simple. All right, so we've been cutting for, I don't know, a few afternoons after work with this blade and it's starting to get dull. The teeth still have a bit of sharpness to them but they're not cutting uh, through the oak as well as they should be. And when you let the blade get dull, you start to get a really wavy cut. It'll rise and fall through the log. Um, so then you don't get as good of lumber. And it's also just more wear and tear on the machine. You know, the engine has to work harder. You have to push harder. So having a sharp band in the blade saw is really important. So we're working with a Woodland Mills HM126 here. It's been a great little mill so far. Uh, it belongs to my buddy. I used it a few years ago to mill up all the lumber for the woodshed that you can see in the background. And he was kind enough to let me borrow it again to mill the lumber for Arabella. So we've been running it almost every day for, oh gosh, three weeks now. And it's been doing great. I opened up the doors. And then on this side, there's a handle that goes to a big bolt. And that adjusts the tension on this wheel. And this is our drive pulley that comes off the motor which churns this belt 
which turns this wheel, which turns the band, which turns the other wheel. And that's how it cuts. And then there's adjustment screws for these wheels that'll make them play in or out so you can adjust the tracking on the band. Uh, sometimes the band wants to walk itself off or want to walk itself back, uh, which isn't good. So you can adjust those tracking. So I've loosened that screw, which has allowed this wheel to come forward enough and take some of the tension off the blade. Got my gloves on, because even though this dull, blade is dull, it's still pretty sharp. Pop it off there. And stick that off to the side. I'll grab a fresh blade here. Now doing this is very important to have gloves on because obviously these blades are really sharp. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that the teeth are going in the correct direction. Uh, the saw does not want to cut if you put the bands in backwards. All right. Now since this is loose, the tracking's all out of alignment and if I try to spin it, the blade's just going to come off the front or it's going to come off the back. So I'm going to go through and just push it where I want it. get it lined up by hand, and then I'll tighten up the pulley and take it for a test spin. So if you see here, these teeth are quite a bit off the, the wheel and they're not all the way flush in the back. And then down here, the teeth are barely sticking out past the wheel. So what we want is to bring these forward so that not only the teeth are passed, but the gullet is passed a little bit. And we'll push this in the back. It doesn't have to be totally perfect, but we'll get it pretty close. And we'll check and make sure that we're sitting in the guides right. You don't want to be under them or over them. That happens sometimes. And the other wheel looks good. You can see that the teeth are, and the gullets are both clear of the pulley. So these are the teeth. And between the teeth, these are the gullets. So when they cut, these teeth shear out a bit of wood. And that wood rides in this gullet until it comes out the other end of the saw and out of the cut of the wood and gets thrown clear. So we want to make sure that the teeth and the gullets are past the wheel. So I'm just going to spin it a few times and see if it's walking on or walking off or touching the guides or what it's doing. And you can see it's not touching the bearing here and it's not touching the bearing here and that's good. Those should only be there if you hit something hard in the wood, like you hit a big knot or maybe a a nail or something and it wants to push this blade back and that's the only time it should ever touch these bearings is when it hits something hard and it touches them for a second and the bearings spin a little bit and then they come forward in the cut. If you're riding on the bearings it means that the blade's either too far back or you're pushing way too hard. So the tracking seems good, it's not touching the bearings, it's smoothing, flowing smoothly between the guide blocks. So I'm pleased with that. Now when you turn these, you be very careful that you never ever ever put your hand on top. Because as you can see, you're going to run it between the blade and the wheel. And when this gets going, you've got a good amount of momentum. So if you accidentally came up and put your thumb there or something, you'd pinch it real real bad. So, real careful with that. It's another reason to wear gloves. So the blade's tight, tracking seems good, we're not riding on any of the bearings. So let's close it up and start cutting up this log. Due to the fact that I had a full-time job at the time, Steve had been working on all the physical aspects of the build by himself. Rough going, but he did have some help every once in a while. Here you can see him and Sean working on milling the timbers for the wooden keel. The wooden keel is basically the backbone of the boat. We would need to have a massive timber if we were to make it all out of one piece. Unfortunately, it is very difficult to find trees big enough for this nowadays. We therefore decided to mill several large slabs, which we will then put together to make up the final dimensions of the wooden keel. As you can see, these slabs are still pretty heavy. Sean and Steve's grandfather helped him get them onto the trailer and then closer to the site where we would be building the boat. Moving these keel timbers is not an easy feat. Even with two people, it takes a considerable amount of time and a lot of coordination.
Even after all that hard work, there was still a lot more to be done. So Kelsey and I drove down to lend a helping hand. While I was working with Steve's grandfather skidding some logs, Kelsey learned how to run the mill with Steve. Never mind $2 a day, it's gonna be $10 a shot. With the camera. Maybe I should get myself all ready to go. All right, skidding logs is a little bit of a process. First, you gotta grab a chain. That chain needs to go under the log, so you have to find a way to slide it under. If you can't get it completely under, then you need to get a PV hook. With that PV hook, you're gonna roll that log back over the chain. Now you can slide it all the way around and you hook it back up to itself. Once that's done, get the tractor, hook the chain up to the back of the tractor, and you use that to skid it to where you need it to go. All right, once you have it roughly in place to where you need, you need to line up the logs with the mill. In order to do that and keep things organized, you need to make sure that those logs are right up against each other. So if you take a PV hook and you roll those logs up against each other, at some point, one end is gonna butt up against the others and you just keep rolling and that'll pivot that log over. Once you got those logs parallel, they'll be much easier for you to roll up and onto the mill. Now with the boards cut and stacked neatly on the wagon, they need some time to dry out. So what we have to do is bring them close to the boathouse, we'll stack them there, and let them dry until we need to use them. There's Steve, over in the corner. Hi. I'm very, very tired, Steve. <laughs> How much do you work this week? Uh, I don't want to know. <laughs> Started sawmilling Friday after work, and I got out somewhat early, so it was maybe like 2 o'clock, and uh, I haven't really stopped until today, so today's 10 days on of sawmilling and or logging. So, I don't know, I've been doing it probably 10, 11 hours a day most days. Right on. Yeah. Probably gonna continue after this week, right? As yeah, well I go back to work time. tomorrow. So I'll do like 40 hours at the gym this week. And I don't know, a guesstimate, probably another 20 to 30 of sawmilling during the week and another probably 20 hours over the weekend. And then back to work the next day. No Keep rest for the weary. Keeping you young. <laughs> Keeping me young or making me old, I can't really decide. Man, where can you sure work up a thirst? This water tastes funny to you guys. I mean, something's wrong with it. I don't know what's up. <laughs> 